everybody. I'm Ellie. Uh, I head up the R&D group at Arundo Analytics. So just to give you a very quick introduction uh, to myself. Um, I'm originally trained as a particle physicist, an experimentalist, uh, where I worked on a detector which had a very, very large number of sensors equipped on it, many of which I actually plugged in by hand. Um, so, so when I was working there, I spent a lot of time thinking about sensor data and kind of looking for um, needles in haystacks in a, a very, very, very large amount of sensor data. Um, I left academia uh, almost a decade ago now uh, and worked for um, three software companies now um, in the area of data science and particularly specializing around um, how to make the most out of sensor data. Again, uh, mainly uh, Internet of Things. I did quite a lot of work in Formula One. Turns out that Formula One cars look refreshingly similar to oil rigs if you're a data scientist. Um, and now I work for Arundo, which you've heard a lot about already, so I think I probably don't need to introduce that, introduce that any further. So I'm going to talk about <coughs> decentralized computing in industrial IoT. Uh, we've been working for three years in Arundo now, helping our customers um, make the most of their data. We're increasingly becoming to, uh, coming to believe that decentralized computing brings a lot to this industry. Um, so I'm going to share some thoughts um, on, on why we think that is. All right. So uh, this is a bit of a no-brainer, given the topic of the conference. I think everybody knows this. Equipment operations are becoming data-driven, um, not entirely data-driven. Uh, we've heard a lot about hybrid modeling so far in this conference, um, but certainly data is playing an increasing part in helping uh, this guy make better decisions on the rig. Um, my read is uh, that is not because the algorithms are getting better, it's because the underlying technology has gotten better. So my dad, who's now, uh, I think he's heading on 80 now, loves to tell me how he did his PhD in artificial intelligence you know, back in the 60s and how I think I'm so cool that we're now doing AI. And he's like, we've been doing that since you know, 20 years before you were born. So I think there's not been a huge amount of... Um, uh, <coughs> There's not been a huge revolution in the algorithms, but there has been a huge revolution in the underlying technology, uh, increasing availability of sensors, cheaper storage and compute, and therefore increased adoption of machine learning because now the data is actually becoming available, so people are starting to use it. Data-driven workflow, fairly well-trodden territory. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here with this, with this audience. Uh, I think most of us know how it goes. Um, traditionally, it's been get all your data in a big old data lake in the cloud, um, train a model from it, model train, and then get your model and stick it on some real-time data. So that could be, hopefully, in an application, um, a solution in front of somebody, in our case that's usually an operator, help them make better decisions, help them avoid um, unplanned downtime, that kind of thing. Uh, to me, the, the traditional workflow is going from big data to fast data. Right? And then you see a lot, of, a lot of talks out there saying the quicker you can make it from big data to fast data to big to fast, uh, the quicker you converge on value. Because we all know that you don't really know straight up what's the best model, what's the best use case. These things are highly iterative. Um, and so to be able to iterate quickly to a solution that really works, you want to have a slick mechanism to go from this to this. Otherwise, you inevitably end up building the wrong thing. So that's how people have been doing this for quite a long time. But I would say, here be dragons. This approach often fails to scale, I would say especially in industrial IoT. Um, so I've worked across industry. I've done a lot of work, as I said, in IIoT, but I've also worked in, in finance, in retail. Um, I would say that they, um, it's easier for them to get their models into production and scaling across all of their data and many use cases. Um, you see these kind of quotes. I suspect this may resonate. A lot of AI projects remain in the domain of data science. Um, there's probably some organizational um, uh, considerations there, but that's beyond the scope of this talk, and it's been covered in other talks. Um, so why does it not work in industrial IoT? Uh, so. 
I would say that um, something like an oil rig poses really unique challenges compared to a lot of other industries. Um, the thing that is generating the data in real time looks like this. Right? It's, it's completely stranded and remote. Um, there is connectivity, of course, to oil rigs and vessels, but um, it's often you can't stream raw data to the cloud all the time. Connection can be flaky, can go down for long periods of time. Um, it's expensive, satellite communication, so streaming large amounts of data off uh, a vessel or a ship, is, uh, a vessel or an, a rig, it can be very expensive. Thirdly, the security implications of doing that. So there's a lot of companies out there who do not want to stream their raw data straight off their asset because they're worried about hackers, they're worried about people tapping into the data streams, there's all sorts of constraints. So often it's just not possible to stream raw data off an asset, and that creates a bit of a difficulty for data scientists. The second thing is that the person who you're trying to influence using all of your data science models is very often our friend um, who's on the rig, the operator, the solution. He's the decision maker or she. They're, they're king of the data science world in this industry. They're the person who needs to see the information. They're the person whose decision we need to influence. And if the solution is stranded you know, up in the cloud somewhere and they can't see it because you've got connectivity problems, then you're not going to help inform their decisions. The third thing is around fleet. So we've talked a lot about data sparsity over the last two days. Um, if you don't have enough data, it really doesn't matter how clever your data scientists are, they're not going to build a good model. And so if you've got rare events going on on this rig and you've got rare events going on on another rig, and you want to combine those together in a single model, if these two rigs are physically disconnected and they can't you know, talk to each other, then you're not going to be able to build a good model um, and keep that up to date. Due to this, many industrial IoT data science efforts, from what I've seen, ended up in what we call the dreaded PowerPoint graveyard. So I've personally got a couple of my own tombstones in here, build a model, um, there's nowhere to put it, um, so you make a PowerPoint presentation. Um, everyone likes the PowerPoint, and they say it looks like a very nice model, and then go back six months later and say, so how's the model? Is it you know, generating value for you? And they say, well, no, you handed over some Python code to someone who's left the company, and nobody knows how to run it, so it's sort of just there, but it was a really nice presentation. And that's, that's incredibly, I found that on a personal level, incredibly depressing, and it's also depressing for the customers because they're not making um, enough out of their, quite frankly, very expensive data scientists. Right, so there is an answer. Enter the solution. So edge computing is on the rise in many industries. Um, I really love this Google, um, and you call it Google Counts, where you type in a term into Google and it tells you over the years how many people have Googled the same thing. A lot of fun, you can have a lot of fun with that. Um, so cloud computing, really big in 2012, still pretty big. Edge computing, nobody's talking about it in 2014. It's incredible how quickly this industry mo uh, moves. But now, you know, a lot of people are asking about that. Those of you who are data people <laughs> will notice these are not to scale. I've cheated a little bit. I even went as far as downloading accounts, putting it into Tableau and making my own chart so I could kind of big this one up a, a bit. Don't want to mislead you. It's still much smaller than cloud computing, but it's, you know, that's definitely a trend, right? <coughs> Thanks to Google, particularly in mobile phones. So those of you who are following this kind of stuff have seen that Google has released a whole load of stuff in recent months um, about federated learning. Um, I don't know if anyone's following that. Um, they're talking about mobile phones. They've also um, put some associated hardware out there called Coral. Um, so the reason why Google want to do that is um, if you, I think I mentioned it yesterday, if you have your phone, so to Google, the edge means your phone. Um, if you're you know, typing in some word and then you complete that word, that's a little training example for Google for their predictive text um, engine. And so what they're doing is they would like to train the model on the edge, so train a model which is looking at your autocomplete on your phone and send not your raw data, because it turns out people don't like sending their raw data to Google, um, but send the model parameters back to 
Google in this paradigm they call federated learning, then train a model on all those little models that have been trained, and then push that model back to all phones. So they are doing a lot of computing on the edge. They want to scale to billions of phones, right? I don't want to scale to billions of compressors, but I'd like to scale to you know, maybe 20 or 30. That's the typical size of a fleet. And so we think there's a lot of parallels in asset-heavy industries. And so in Arundo, we're starting to build out an edge network that will meet the challenges that I described earlier. So um, I think quite a few of you have probably heard about Arundo Edge Agent in one of the sessions yesterday, but I'll just give um, a brief recap. So <coughs> we have an edge agent. Quite a lot of companies also have an edge agent. Um, what it does is it's a piece of software that you would install on an asset, like a rig, like a ship, um, and it connects to sensor data that's in the control system, and it can send that somewhere. So it can store that locally, it can send it to the cloud, it can kind of send it to wherever you like. Um, the second thing that this edge agent can do is it can, uh, our edge agent at least, can run um, models. So that could be basically any kind of mod model which is conversant in Python. Uh, you can do rather a lot in Python these days, so that means most things. So what you can do is you can train a machine learning model, you can train a physical model, you can train some data quality algorithm, whatever you like, as long as it sits in Python world. And you can deploy that to the edge, this piece of software here. So basically what's happening is your model is not running in the cloud, it's running on the rig itself. So I like to think of the edge agent as a two-way communication between a, a remote asset like a rig and the cloud. A communication between onshore and offshore. Uh, so um, the edge agent that we have is uh, we have a partnership with Dell. Uh, so it's available on, um, on Dell boxes, which would be installed um, on places like rigs. The reason why I really wanted to show you this is we're not hardware vendor, it's, it's purely software on our part. So we looked to partners like Dell to provide the, the hardware. All right, so the way that we're thinking about it, first, connect the data. So we've talked about stranded data, um, something that an edge agent, ours, someone else's, any edge agent can do is it can tap into the control system, get the data, it can send it to the cloud, it can also send it locally and store it. So that's kind of the first stage. Second stage, so this is where it starts getting interesting, um, for me as a data scientist anyway, is uh, connecting a solution. You'll notice I talk about solutions. I don't talk so much about models. Model in isolation doesn't do very much for a company, whereas a solution that may or may not have a model sitting underneath it, powering predictions, it starts to get useful for a company. So when I talk about solutions, I really mean an application. So that could be, you know, a lot of our customers, they're running um, applications in the cloud where they've deployed a machine learning model into that application, and it's doing something like predicting remaining useful life, predicting failure, predicting something that's going to help our operator do what they really want to do, which is reduce unplanned downtime or schedule their maintenance accordingly. So that thing can be running in the cloud. You could be streaming the data from the edge the application is running in the cloud, someone here is looking at it, making predictions, making decisions, phoning our friend on the rig and getting them to do the right thing. But what if you want to actually have the person on the rig, or that could be also a ship captain making the decisions? So what our edge agent can do is you can deploy a machine learning model and the full solution, so an application that is actually running next to the operator and next to the data. So in a way, you kind of join in the dots up and you're making sure you've got co-location of operator, model, and data. Operator, solution, and data. Finally, you can connect the fleet. So if you're saying, okay, well, we've got one compressor um, which has a couple of failures on one rig, and we've got another compressor which has another failure on another rig. We want to kind of join those insights together. We want to build a compressor model that has access to failure data as it arrives. Um, and so if you've got this two-way communication between one rig and the cloud, and another rig and a cloud, then you can actually have these things start to communicate with each other. So the whole thing starts to talk, turn into not just um, a set of edge agents, you know, two-way communications, but something that looks more like a mesh or a grid. 
so to make this decentralized computing idea, uh, I'm a data scientist, so I spend most of my time thinking about machine learning. Um, it can mean a lot of things to different people, but to me, it, it's a different way of thinking about machine learning, kind of moving away from this idea that you've got to have your big data set all in the same place. You've got some centralized repository where you put all the data. Rather, you've got lots of disparate data sets, and if you have a way for them all to communicate together, it's much easier to keep your models updated. It's much easier to be able to kind of leverage the power of all the data that you're generating on, on the whole fleet. Um, Just going to look at the time. Got a while left. Uh, so what can we do with this? Um, so one thing is um, ability to have more accurate equipment monitoring. So <coughs> equipment monitoring is something at a window. That's what we spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, so how do you monitor um, a pump, compressor, heat exchanger, generator? We tend to deal at the equipment level. Um, so there's some data science in there. There's being able to predict failure, remaining useful life, um, that kind of thing. And then there's also, uh, you probably, if you're in the panel, you probably picked up I'm kind of a big advocate of doing simple things first. I think most people in this industry are thinking in a similar way. So being able to report, you know, what is the state of a union as well? So KPIs, efficiencies, that kind of thing, as well as um, machine learning powered predictions. So if you wanted to do this on a remote asset, like um, say um, a heat exchanger, this one's for pump, um, this is on a remote asset. The current challenges can be stranded data. So like I said, if you've got a rig, you've got limited connectivity for a bunch of reasons to onshore. Stranded solutions. So um, industrial data has this really irritating habit of changing. So things get swapped in. You know, rigs can move. Uh, components can wear out and just gradually degrade. So if you've got like data from 2018 and you bring that you know, onshore, put it into a um, cloud-based solution, build a model, deploy that model, your model eventually is going to start alerting your operators all the time when what has actually just happened is that the thing is slowly kind of degrading and operating point is not what it was a year ago. Um, so if you don't have a slick mechanism to kind of retrain and adapt to change in underlying behavior, the data can grow stale. Um, the third challenge is stranded fleet, like I was talking about earlier. Failures are rare, right? And if you've just got one model trained on one um, heat exchanger, you may be looking at a handful of, of, um, of failure events. Uh, to give an uh, analogy, if you're trying to train a um, model to dis distinguish between pictures of dogs and cats, if you give that model you know, a million pictures of cats and then you give it a picture of a chihuahua and a picture of a Great Dane, and you say, can you identify a dog for me? The model will probably say no. You know, you give me two pictures of dogs, but you say dogs, and I, there's not a lot of similarity, and that's exactly what it's like building models in predictive maintenance. You know, so if you've got a Dane, a chihuahua, a Labrador, a poodle, another poodle, then you start to get, you know, better accuracy. So that's kind of the third challenge, is if you're just dealing with one asset in the fleet, you typically run into limited failure data. So the solution um, that we think could work there is to deploy predictive maintenance model onto an edge agent that is running on the assets where that can retrain periodically. So it will actually train itself online. Um, the flip side of that, just in the interest of full disclosure, if you don't have you know, access to a data lake with all contextual data from all time, yeah, you do lose context and you do lose accuracy of the model. That's inevitable. But having a model which has access to, you know, say, the latest two months of data is a lot better that can actually go into production, actually get in front of someone who's making decisions is a lot better than having no model at all, which is often what is the case. So being able to deploy a predictive maintenance model onto the edge, and then additionally, if you could crowdsource the failure data across the network, I think then you start to get onto something. So decentralized computer helps in that it connects the data. Perhaps you only need to stream aggregates, not the entire raw data stream, which as we've seen is not always possible. Um, <coughs> connects the model with the data as it's being generated on the rig. 
And finally, maybe you can compare these um, valuable rare fa failure events across a fleet. All right, uh, another example. So we do quite a lot of work in, in maritime. I'd say maybe these kind of solutions are even more important in maritime with vessels because they connectivity is even more of an issue um, with certain types of vessels than it is on rigs, I'd say. Uh, so the use case is um, better decisions on sh ship operation. So the way that you would um, operate a ship, if you kind of try to get there um, to your destination really fast, then you burn a lot of fuel, um, which is expensive. But if you say, okay, well, I, I want to optimize my fuel, so I'm going to go there really slowly, I'm going to take my time, you're actually a maintenance risk because you're operating the vessel for longer periods of time than you maybe need to. So it's kind of a bit of a toss-up between fuel optimization and um, maintenance, um, optimal maintenance. Um, now, the problem in um, maritime is it's often not clear what is um, optimal performance. There's no kind of clear benchmark of, what would be the optimal performance, you know, how, you know, for the captain, how should I, you know, how much should I be kind of pushing this ship? Um, it's difficult to get um, an overview of performance and benchmarks across a fleet of vessels because they're remote. Um, so if you want to have a solution in front of a captain who's on a ship, that can be difficult because of the connectivity. Um, and then there's not really any overall performance benchmark. So if you want to compare your ship to you know, a fleet of other ships if you're a ship captain, that's difficult to do because the data is not kind of communicating with itself. Um, so one solution could be computing ship performance on the edge, sending those aggregates, not the raw data, but sailing, sending some sort of aggregate onshore where that could exist in an onshore application that say a fleet manager could be looking at and then they can phone the captain and say hey you're you're you know you're really not in a good place in this curve you're you're a maintenance risk you need to do this that and the other or you could even have an application running on the edge um, so a GUI on the edge in front of a captain um, pr providing insight on how they're you know comparing against the rest of the captains in the fleet so they can um, operate the ship better. All right, um, yep, yeah, so I want to leave just a few minutes in case there's any questions. Uh, so the conclusion uh, is that uh, our opinion is decentralized computing. Um, first of all, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about that in the next few years. Um, we think it's particularly important in industrial IoT because it enables really scalable data-driven uh, solutions, scalable across a fleet, scalable um, uh, across you know large numbers of failures, um, scalable across connectivity and keeping models update and fresh um, even, even as the underlying data um, changes. And that's due to, um, in my opinion, this issue of connectivity. If you're connecting the data and the solutions and the fleet, then you really start to be able to build good, uh, good data-driven solutions. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>